I'm getting into this habit where I stay up till 4 a.m. and then I don't get out of bed until 1 p.m., which is exactly what's going on right now. It is now 3 p.m. and I'm finally gonna leave the Airbnb to head to my first attraction. I'm gonna have to skip lunch and everything because I wanna make sure that I fit in everything throughout the day. On one hand, it's good that I'm getting more sleep. On the other hand, I really need to balance my shit out so that I can actually follow my itinerary. But I'm gonna try to get to my first attraction, which is called Museum Romantico, and I will bring you along with me. But then I found this little off-the-road pathway that I thought was super cool because it's basically stairs descending and as you go down you get to see a view of the city from here. I'm obviously a little bit lower so you don't get to see the whole view but once you get up on top you can pretty much see it. I only went down here because I saw there was like a cool mural here and I realized that a lot of the colors are similar to one of the books I brought with me today called Sweet Bean Paste. So I took a few photos trying out how they might match for my bookstagram and then I took a few other self times photos as well it's really nice to be able to kind of take my time to explore anything that kind of captures my eye and not stick too close to my itinerary I'm kind of enjoying just walking around the town and seeing what else there is to explore and discover something that I was thinking about while I was kind of daydreaming along the bus ride was I keep on going back to the story that I want to publish, which I can't say what it is because I want to keep it a secret, but I keep on getting so many ideas for what kind of themes that I want to convey and what specific scenes I want to make sure gets put into the second draft. I feel so inspired by just having the time and space to really think and imagine these kinds of things. I wish I could start on it right now. My original plan was that I was going to finish all of my design side projects this year and then make the time and space to fully dive into the novel next year. But I don't know if I can wait that long, so I'm trying to figure out how I can balance my time. Because if I just forget all of my design side projects and then work on my novel right now, I feel like nothing will ever get done. I'm the kind of person that has to focus on one thing at a time. It's tough because all I want to do is just work on my novel right now, but I know that I need to finish the design stuff first. So I don't know, it's kind of a creative dilemma at the moment. I wonder if I can try to meet in the middle where I don't exactly have to write the story right now, but I can try to document all of the ideas that I have and have a more detailed outline so that when I do work on the second draft next year, I'll have more of a comprehensive plan to work off of. So that's kind of my headspace right now, but I'm pleasantly surprised that I'm getting like this time to really think about these projects that I want to do now that I've been able to travel on my own and I think oh wow I have like th this terrible cowlick <laughs> while I'm talking but I think usually when I travel with other people I'm so caught up on whether they feel comfortable and whether they're having fun that I don't really have time to kind of daydream and think about myself and my life and various things that I want to do and I feel like if I had traveled with my friends here it would have been a different kind of fun experience but i probably wouldn't have been able to have the headspace to be able to think about my story a little bit more because i would have been caught up in trying to make sure the logistics were fine for the whole group and making sure that my friends were having a good time but all i had to worry about is myself and it's nice so yeah this is a great spot to just sit and think and I guess I'm gonna take some time to reflect a little bit before I actually head off to the museum. But after the museum, I saw that there was this huge garden nearby, so I think I'm gonna stop by over there as well. Anyway, let's head off to the museum. 
change of plans I'm not going to the museum after all because there's just this giant park surrounding it that I feel like is way more interesting than whatever is inside the building and is completely free so I'm pretty much gonna spend my time over here instead also what the fuck is this there's water dripping off of that moss and it's landing on a picture of a desert is this symbolism At this point, I don't quite know where I am. I kind of just wandered elsewhere, but at least I have a great view. And I've been trying to record like the view from up here, but I feel like the camera doesn't do it any justice compared to when you're actually there. But hopefully you understand like how impressive it is to just see so much of the city from here. Porto is definitely a different feeling from Lisbon. I feel like I didn't really get to explore enough of Lisbon to properly compare the two, but I like them both for different reasons. A few updates. First of all, I think my bug bite is getting worse and I know I shouldn't be scratching it but I'm so fucking itchy. There's like one here 
and then one here and then there's like another one on my elbow and god knows what else i was wandering through this rose garden and then i turned around and all of a sudden i saw this giant peacock and i was like what the fuck who the fuck are you and it kept on staring at me and then it got closer to me literally last night i had finished reading the astonishing color of actor which is about an asian girl whose mom turns into a bird and she's like dude my mom turned into a bird i need to go find her so it was so weird for me to like suddenly turn around and see this bird following me and then I'm like dude am I a main character now so I'm just staring at this peacock and I'm like dude did my mom turn into a bird? The only book that I read today is I Am Afraid of Men by Vivek Shraya. This is by a South Asian author who is a trans woman. So far, it's pretty good. The book is kind of a series of essays about the author's experiences shaping the way that she views or the way that she fears the world around her because a lot of our culture has been shaped by the violence of men. It's very fitting for for me to read this type of book while I'm waiting for my bus all alone in the dark. Fun times. I walked back to the Airbnb all alone in the dark, so that was pretty fun. There's this one part that I dog-eared because I thought that it was a really poignant way of thinking. I'm afraid of the ways in which the threat of violence from men has shaped or even damaged my sexuality. How many sexual desires and fantasies are formed out of potential or actual male violence? Or rather, to what extent is sexuality shaped and constrained by childhood experiences of male violence? What might desire feel like if the construction of sexuality didn't take place in tandem with childhood experiences of violence from men. This topic is a whole sociological discussion when you look back to the way porn depicts the treatment of women by men or just the way that we've romanticized these kinds of things in movies and media. It was kind of a sobering thing for me to read about on my way home because as you know, this is my first solo trip. I was still very willing to do it because I just wanted to experience it for myself and like find out if I could do it. And the answer is yes, I can do it. But I think like a lot, sorry, I'm trying to like shift onto this couch here. <clears throat> anyway, a big part of what I've had to consider traveling on my own is my safety. I mean, when you're traveling, safety is always a factor for you to consider. But I think that when you're traveling alone as a woman, that's a whole other can of worms. When I'm walking back to the Airbnb alone or when I'm walking around the city at night, it's a very real possibility that I could be attacked or assaulted and if I see another man that's walking in my direction I have to mentally prepare myself to figure out how I'm gonna act if he just suddenly charges and attacks me because shit like that can happen it's kind of a miracle when I get back to this Airbnb every day safe bug bites and all you know it's a miracle that I'm still alive it's a shame that we have to be so careful about these things when we can't just simply enjoy ourselves. It has always been men that have come up to me to try to sell me something or try to hit on me or just try to make conversation with me. Like literally even when I'm reading a book in public or even when I'm listening to headphones, people will still go out of their way to come up to me and bother me. And I think the reason why so many people were bothering me and disturbing me was because they were operating under the assumption that Asian women are more submissive and vulnerable and will put up to all of your bullshit. I'm looking forward to reading the rest of this in order to learn more and, you know, try to stay woke. Tomorrow, I am definitely gonna wake up earlier. If I don't, you have my permission to reach across the screen and bitch slap me. There is a library that supposedly inspired JK Rowling to create Hogwarts in the sense where a lot of the architecture had inspired how Hogwarts looks like. That's kind of like what I've heard. Maybe it's the other way around or maybe it's just a bunch of bullshit. But regardless, it's supposedly a very aesthetically pleasing bookstore. It's so popular that apparently you have to buy a ticket in order to access the bookstore. I will see you later tomorrow morning when I wake up. I will for sure wake up this time. Guess what? I woke up at 1 p.m. again. 
And now I'm leaving at 3 p.m. once again. You now have permission to reach across the screen and slap me across the face. Really, the only thing that I truly, truly wanted to see was the bookstore that inspired JK Rowling. So we are gonna go there right now and I will bring you along with me and let's see what all the fuss is about. <laughs> night in Portugal and I decided that I wanted to film it out here since we already have the nice view of the bridge instead of just filming it in my Airbnb because it's my last night so why not but I can't believe it's already been a week 
Um, there's the train right there. This is the first time that I'm kind of taking like a solo trip by myself and really just going at my own pace. And I'm allowing myself to do things like sleep in or kind of just change my plans and not stick to my itinerary and just let myself wander around and do whatever I want. It's been a really nice change of pace. A lot of times every day I get caught up in my responsibilities and everything that I need to do, basically kind of like following an itinerary or a schedule. And I always feel like I either have to catch up or else I'm gonna be behind. And it's been nice to kind of have the time and space to just do whatever I want. Just reminding myself that it's okay to slow down every once in a while and it's okay to not be so busy all the time and just let my brain wander. Actually, it's a very good thing if I let my brain wander because then it kind of leads me to things that I want to focus more energy on, like writing my book, focusing on things that make me happy rather than things that I feel like I need to do or things that I feel like I should do. I got to catch up a lot on A Thousand Beginnings and Endings. I have like about 20 pages or so left. Is it just me or is like the second half of the book way better than the first half? Because all of a sudden the quality of the stories in the second half just kind of shot up. I don't know why we had to wade through all of that crap in the first half to get to the good shit. My favorite story is now Spear Carrier. It's weird because usually I do not like this kind of writing style where it's very casual stream of consciousness but I think that the way that the author writes it like he's able to pull it off well I tapped the page where it has I think what might be my favorite quote of the book so far he's basically defining what real life is and he's saying that real life isn't what food you eat or how much sleep you get or how much you sweat or even about relationships he's saying real life happened in your mind real life meant dissecting your sensory experience the evidence of your eyes and ears then analyzing the pieces using knowledge you'd gain from books and reassembling it all into some semblance of a self yes that was exactly it real life was about deciding who you were but that wasn't a thing you could tell to someone. If I had come home and said to my mom, yeah, I thought for hours a day about whether there was anything in life that was worth dying for and decided ultimately that there wasn't, then what would she say? The short story touches upon the subject matter of heroism and whether it's worth it for someone to sacrifice their life on the battlefield and does that make them a hero? Or do we really only consider heroes to be people who have won and we kind of just forget all of the lives that have sacrificed themselves? Rather than a complete narrative, the author was trying to go for a thought piece instead. And I feel like when you're writing a short story, that probably works better than trying to cram a narrative into a few pages. There were a couple of other stories that I liked, like the daughter of the son here. I don't think the narrative was like amazing, but I thought the writing was more exceptionally beautiful here. There was another one called Bullet Butterfly. It was kind of like a more tragic tale where I really felt like I was reading a mythology story. Overall, I just think the short stories in the second half of the book were way more interesting than the first half. So it's good to know that like the short stories get better. It's basically my update for tonight. I will probably finish this book tomorrow when I take the train back to Lisbon and then I'll be able to start on Girls of Paper and Fire. I have to wake up around 5 a.m. because I have to take like a train at 6 a.m. to Lisbon. As long as I can catch my train and I can catch my flight and I can safely make it to America back on time, I'm good. If you have been watching these vlogs up until now, I hope that this kind of gave you a taste of what Portugal was like. Thank you for following me on this journey because even though it was a solo trip, I also had fun bringing in the camera along and trying to document everything that I saw and everything that I did knowing that there might be an audience that would be interested in seeing it and kind of experiencing it secondhand as well. I hope that everyone watching this is doing well and I hope that you are taking care of yourselves. I am certainly trying to take better care of myself as you can tell from constant contemplations that I've been airing out in these vlogs. This is something that we can all work on together. If you are not feeling well right now, I hope you know that things will get better. Despite what you might feel right now, there is so much more to the world and to life that you have yet to experience. If you hang on a little while longer and if you just keep your eyes and ears open to all the opportunities out there, you will be able to experience tons of new things that you wouldn't have imagined otherwise. This is getting very cheesy, so I'm gonna end it now. But basically, thanks for being here. I hope that everyone is doing well. And if not, I hope that everyone will work on being well. And good night.
at a hostel in New York. I decide to stay here for the night before I take my last flight back home. All the other girls have already checked out, but I wanted to give one last update for the vlog before I board my flight. I finished Girls of Paper and Fire while I was on the plane ride. While it wasn't amazing, what I have appreciated about it is that it takes the standard structure for a YA fantasy narrative that so often pairs, you know, ordinary peasant girl with a powerful abusive king and romanticizes that relationship, it takes that dynamic and it finally addresses how problematic it is. It kind of twists the narrative a little bit so that it's more focused on empowering the main character and having her break free from that kind of unhealthy relationship and being able to claim her agency. And it deals with like a lot of important topics like sexual abuse. It's a more refreshing take on what we have been so used to romanticizing in the genre. Despite the greatness of how it has like LGBT themes and how it subverts the standard structure, it's still at the core of it kind of like a basic generic fantasy but just with those strong points that nudge it a little bit higher. I still enjoyed reading it though. It was quite a quick read for me because I thought the pacing was really good. I do wish that the romantic relationship between the main character and her love interest was better developed instead of insta-lovey. I also think that the main character is kind of like generic and not that special or great like the book tries to make her seem to be. I asked Jesse, who loves the book, why other people didn't really like it as much. Jesse summarized it as three main points why people didn't like it. The first was the instant love, which I agree with. The second was apparently the main character whines too much about being a concubine. I'm not even gonna bother <laughs> addressing that. Well, okay, here's the thing. I do think that the main character is kind of basic and not that special, but it's not because she's whining about being a concubine, okay? It's just like her personality, you know? She's just like a very generic main character. And if she did have to whine about something, I think being forced to sleep with this nasty, bold, furry king is plenty of reason <laughs> to whine about that shit. And then the third reason was that the main character slut shames another character for falling in love with the king. First of all, this character was not being slut shamed. She was being dumb bitch shamed because she's a dumb bitch. The moment that you read about her when she's first introduced, I could already fucking tell that she's the weakest link among all of the girls that are chosen. I think that she deserves to be dumb bitch shamed <laughs> because you should not be falling in love with a terrible, abusive man. Like literally the main character told her, you can do better. Because I finished the book so early, I actually ended up having five more hours left on my plane ride and I had no other book with me to read and I was just itching to read another book to pass the time. I ended up starting another book that the lady that was sitting next to me on the plane had just finished reading. It was X's and O's by Beth Kendrick. <sighs> this book you know, I did this to myself. I was like, let's be spontaneous and let's just pick a random book that I never would have been able to read otherwise. She gave it to me, that's why I still have a copy of it. In order to not feel like I wasted my time reading this book, I'm gonna make a whole separate review video about <laughs> what goes on in this book. I basically have two more books to read. I have this book, I'm Afraid of Men. I didn't get to read this on the plane because I hadn't brought it with me on my carry-on. And then I have The Boat SBS, which is a graphic novel that's online. I've been meaning to wait until I'm back home to just have like the time and space to properly consume that when I'm on my computer. Even though I didn't have a spectacular reading month for Asian Readathon, the experience of being able to host this readathon and seeing the amount of people who participated in it, were excited by it, and found meaning in it was really the rewarding aspect of it and being able to raise more diverse stories in the community. I consider this to be a successful readathon. Anyway, I'm gonna go catch my flight now and check out. Thanks for watching this vlog up until now. Goodbye. She came from across the country.